Laura, thank you so much. I really appreciate all the work you've done for our NAMI walk. Interestingly, I learned this morning that Ken Barlow is the MC for the NAMI walk this year. <laughs> Pretty darn neat. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. So you're getting to see him and uh, hear from him a uh, little kind of pre ahead of that on Saturday morning. I know we're going to have a really good turnout. I had the great opportunity to meet Mr. Barlow last year when he was the MC for the Fairview Behavioral um, Dinner Meeting. Uh, it was uh, for many of the donors who have been supporting uh, Fairview uh, Behavioral Health. What a wonderful thing it was for me to be able to sit next to you during dinner and we had a chance to kind of talk about what's going on and I learned about how you have contributed to our community. And uh, so I want to tell you a little bit about Mr. Barlow's background and then introduce him uh, for his talk this morning. Mr. Barlow uh, has been a meteorologist for over 25 years, including 18 years here in Minnesota. Many of you may have seen him on TV. I sure watch him to make sure I know what to wear when I come to work <laughs> in the morning. I really appreciate it, really appreciate it. Um, he has uh, received an Emmy Award and also nominations for his work uh, here in Minnesota and Boston. He is just outstanding at this position. Um, but in additionally, he has uh, been a member of the Board of Directors and Trustees of the Boys and Girls Club in the Twin Cities. He works for Life Source Minnesota and the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention here in the Twin Cities. He works with the Park Nicollet Foundation. He has worked with Fairview in their fundraising. Just unbelievable contributions uh, to our community. He has been awarded the Paul Wellstone Advocacy Award for the Minnesota Psychiatric Society for his work on speaking about mental illness. His talks about this, I believe a few months ago you gave a talk at the Mayo Clinic. Mm -hmm. I really appreciate how you are getting the word out about how we need to recognize and treat and be aware of psychiatric illness in our community. And today you're going to be talking to us about thriving with bipolar one disorders. I understand the topic of your talk. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you, Dr. Schultz. Appreciate Pleasure. it. Pleasure. Thanks for the invitation. Good morning. I am so glad you came downstairs or wherever you came from. Dr. Schultz, first of all, thank you for inviting me. And it was a, it was a great dinner that night. Thank you for humoring me next to my big boss who was sitting there. I was nervous as hell. So thank you for making me laugh. Um, I want to tell my story and how I went from complete shame about telling one of my own brothers that I had bipolar disorder to suddenly talking to thousands of strangers every year because it was quite, it was quite a journey and still is. Um, I want to take you back to when I was in college back when the Earth's mantle was still cooling. It was, it was um, back in the early 80s. <laughs> and I was at college, and you know the way college is. Everything's a little different from the way it was at home. My girlfriend then, who is now my wife, uh, at the time, we noticed I was up a little too much. I was a little too, we called it hyper. I was just too happy. I was never taking naps. I wasn't even sleeping. You know, college kids like to lay in bed. I was out doing stuff. I'd go run eight miles and come back and eat a cheese sandwich and then go walk another 10 or whatever. I just had to get up and do stuff. And at the same time, I was getting straight A's without really even trying, at least according to me. Well, it was fun at first because I was getting straight A's and I was getting a lot of stuff done. But eventually, it, it kind of ground me down and I, and I thought, this isn't right. I had this kind of a buzzing in my head as if I were uh, drinking without drinking. There was this buzz, but I was drinking at the time. Um, there was this buzz happening all the time, and I said, this isn't right. So I went to the school counselor, 
and said what I just told you. So he sent me up for an EEG at the hospital. So my girlfriend and I, wife, borrowed a car, drove 35 miles, had the EEG, and the doctor said, there's nothing wrong with you. So I said, really? I, seriously, I was, kind, I, was hoping for, I was hoping for a brain tumor, honest to God, because I was hoping there was something that it wasn't all in my mind. So I said, OK. I don't know how I got out of that. Eventually, I did. And through the next 18 years, I had ups and downs. They weren't that severe, the ups. But there were downs when I noticed for no reason. I just didn't want to do anything. I just thought it was being a tired dad. It was 1998. We just had our third child, and I didn't care. I couldn't get out of bed. I wasn't eating. All I wanted to do was sleep. And somehow, through all of that, which lasted for about two weeks, every night I was able to take a deep breath, like a lot of us do who suffer from depression. I didn't know that's what it was. Suck it up, go on TV for three minutes and act happy, and go back in the weather office and collapse on my desk. So that's what I did for two weeks. And I told my wife she knew something was wrong. I said, this isn't right. I, I, I'm active. I, lo I love to run. But I didn't care about running, didn't care about my kids, didn't care about anything. So eventually I went to my doctor. And I said, it took me two weeks, but I did. I said, something's going on. I have no energy. I don't feel well. I'm not doing anything I love to do. Gave him the rundown. And he said, oh, you have an August grass allergy. <laughs> I said, really? <laughs> I've never had any allergies before. He said, well, the August grass allergies are really bad right now. Remember, this is 1998, too. And I said, well, OK. So he gave me an inhaler and sent me home. Yeah. The good news is I could breathe really well on the couch. <laughs> so I was, that was a positive. In the backyard. In the backyard, exactly. So again, somehow I got through that. I don't know how, because I didn't think it was a big deal. I thought I had allergies, but I still felt like crap for a while, and eventually I emerged out of it. So I felt OK. Now fast forward, that was 98. Now fast forward to 2006 in the winter or fall. It was November of 2006. I had moved to Boston. My, my dad had passed away, so I went out there to be with my mom. We lived in Minnesota for 15 years or something at the time. Childhood guilt. So I said, we've got to go see my mom. She doesn't see the kids very often. She has to see her grandkids. It was painful to leave CARE 11, but we said this was the best thing. So I was in Boston in November of that year. I had been there for a while already. And my wife and kids were back here because they were finishing school. So every weekend, I was flying back and forth, back and forth. It's like everybody. I'm very close to my kids. I wanted to see them. And I was in a house that we had just bought, which was completely empty. So that's what I had to do. Then I started getting home at midnight, and I bought a treadmill for no reason. And now it's an alarm, but back then it did I don't know why. I just wanted a treadmill. So I went downstairs at 3 in the morning, and I'd run 8 miles on my treadmill. And then I would get off the treadmill, and I could not go to sleep. And I knew I had to sleep because I looked terrible on TV. <laughs> because you can only do so much with makeup. So I just knew it was getting worse and worse. And I, I was getting thinner and thinner. In fact, the next time I came home, my wife said, you look terrible. You look gaunt. And I couldn't see it. I thought I was the peak of my health. I was running. I was awake all the time. I was doing great at work. Um, everything was going great. What are you talking about? So I went home, another couple of months passed, and I was still up like that. So I, I said, this is like it was back in college. I have to go see. There's something going on with my head. It's not normal to feel like this. I shouldn't be running on a treadmill at 3. So somehow, I clicked back to reality and went to a neurologist this time. So I went in, and she gave me an MRI. And you know, it takes a while for the MRI to come back, two weeks or 10 days, whatever it was. And she called me in for the results. And I said, oh my god, finally, I have something wrong. Finally, I know what this is. It was nothing. 
the MRI was clear. So there I was again. I said, well, why do I feel like this? What, what's going on? She said, you have vertigo. Because I told her I had that buzzing in my head. And there are times when you get hypomanic or manic. It feels really good, by the way, that you get this buzz. I know now it's dangerous, but you do get to a point where you're like, wow, it's like being drunk without drinking. That's why I started thinking this is like college. So she told me that, and she gave me some pills. I don't honestly remember what they were. Sent me off, and I got home, and two months later, I'm on the phone with my wife, and everything's fine. I'm having a glass of wine, and everything's great. And I collapsed. I, I called Teresa, my wife, in Minnesota, and I said, something's effed up. Something's not right. And then I wake up. And I look up, and there's a fireman standing there with an ax. And I'm looking at him, I'm like, what the hell is going on? So I thought I was dreaming, because I was kind of in that state of mind, where is this real, is it not real? Because I've always had really vivid, vivid dreams, too. And I've had the sleep paralysis, where you just can't wake up. But none of it ever came together to think that it was something to do with a mood disorder. I didn't know what that was. So they take me to the hospital, and I opened my eyes, and Teresa's standing there. I said, how the hell did you get here so fast? She said, I've been here a week. And I explain it, what I did next, like this. It was like, those of you familiar with the Twilight Zone, the beginning when the things are spinning around, I felt like I was falling down a well. And I just said, what the hell is going on? First of all, I was scared to death. She said, yeah, you've been talking the whole time. I said, what? She said, yeah, you've been seeing a therapist and a psychiatrist, and they have a diagnosis for you. And I said, oh, thank God. And she said, you have bipolar disorder. What's that? <laughs> was the first thing I said. And they explained it to me, and I was pissed. I said, I have nothing wrong with my brain. I'm smart. I have a great life. I've got three great kids. I just got this great job. I'm near my mom. Everything's going right. What do you mean I have bipolar disorder? What is that? And because apparently in my waking coma, whatever you want to call it, I had told the doctor that, which is true, that one night, and you're allowed to laugh at this, one night when I was running on my treadmill at 3 o'clock in the morning, I looked up, and one of the pipes like this, only they were thin metal ones, Ronald Reagan's face was there, which is disconcerting on a couple of reasons. <laughs> but I, I swore to God I saw him looking at me and laughing. And I actually talked back. I remember saying, what the hell are you laughing at? So I was having this thing going on, but I never connected anything. But I told the doctor about it. At the same time, that night and other times, I looked over while I'm running, and there was a box. And one night, I thought I saw, I know I saw, a girl with long blonde hair sitting down, and I got chills. And I stopped the treadmill. I said, what the hell are you doing here? And I, I said the F word a couple times because I was scared. She wouldn't turn around. It was just the back of her head. And I said, what are you doing? And I remember it as clear as day. She had a blue dress on and long blonde hair down to her waist. And I got up to her, and I touched it, and it was a box. And I said, well, OK, what is going on? So apparently, I told the doctors and the therapists this while I was in the hospital. I was angry with the diagnosis, because that's grief, right? I was angry. I was pissed off. So I wasn't doing what I was told to do. I refused to take my medicine. I was acting out um, on myself. I was doing stupid, stupid things, and they put me in solitary and kept me for another week. So I'm in this glassed-in room, separated from the other patients who I'd become friends with during the week, apparently. We were doing round sessions and talking and all this stuff. But I was separated from them now. And I remember this second week so clearly. I know nothing about the first week even now. So I was there for four days, five days. My brother came to visit me and, and snuck in my iPod. 
which was very bad because it had wires and he got in trouble. So I was sitting there listening to music one night and Gladys Knight and the Pips, Midnight Train to Georgia, came on and I love her. And I was laying down and it was one of my ear things was in here and I looked up and Gladys Knight was in my room. <laughs> and I swear it was real. So I started taking my medicine. <laughs> I finally saw the light. So I'm taking the medicine and I'm saying, I'm fine, I'm fine, I'm fine. One night I get up and in order to go to the bathroom, which is what men in their 40s do, I got up in the middle of the night to go use the bathroom and I have to tell the security car guard to let me in and he stands outside the door. So I open the door and there's urine everywhere. There's one other 18 year old kid in there with me on the, in another room and I couldn't even step. It was disgusting and I turned around and I said, I can't go in there, there's pee everywhere. And this is what freed me in my mind. He said, remember where you are. And I had that Twilight Zone thing again, where I kind of fell down the well and I said, holy shit, I've got to get out of here. I don't want to be peeing in the bathroom. I don't want people to think that about me. So I started taking my medicine and sure enough, I got a therapist and a psychiatrist. When you do that, at least where I was, they let me out. So of course, the first thing I do when I get home, I told my mom, by the way, on my way home, she didn't visit me for some reason. She only lived an hour away. I couldn't figure it out. I called her to tell her what I had, and she said, oh yeah, dad had that. And I said, what? <laughs> How could you not tell us? He was too embarrassed. Different generation, he was born in 1936. He was a Marine, he was a football player, he was a dad of five boys. Men at the time, when he was diagnosed at 60, died when he was 68. So those eight years, he was horrified that one of the boys, men, would find out. So he told my mother to swear not to tell us, and she didn't. So I got over that, found out there is a genetic component to it. And because they asked me at the hospital, is anyone in your lineage, your, your family, do they have bipolar disorder, or schizophrenia, or depression? I said, no, we're clean. <laughs> so there's nothing like that in my family. So then with that diagnosis, I, I talked to my mom for a little while and I hung up and I was so mad that when I got home, I said, I know it'll make me happy. So I went on the computer and I, I said, famous bipolar people, right. return. <laughs> I said, oh my God, Ben Stiller? Who knew, he's bipolar. Winston Churchill, believed to be bipolar? And then Britney Spears. <laughs> I said, damn it. <laughs> You almost had me <laughs> of accepting it. And I said, oh my God, that's when she was shaving her head and doing all that stuff because she was manic and nobody knew it and she didn't know it. And now she's doing great. So I, I'm not ripping on her, but you know, I'm a 45 year old guy and finding out I'm like Britney Spears. So it's a little troubling. Um, so I, I did that, but then the Boston Globe would come the newspaper. And I don't know if you remember this, you may, there was a situation in Massachusetts when a, um, an aunt took her niece and nephew that she was watching, undressed them along the highway and walked out onto the highway and all three of them were killed. And the headline was, untreated mental patient kills kids. And I said, wait a minute. And then I got madder because I'm, I know myself and I'm not a murderer. I'm not going to kill, if I want to kill anybody, I'm going to kill myself. And that's the way most mentally ill people are. That if, if they're going to hurt someone, it's most likely to be themselves. You probably know, you have to know that. But I just got angrier and angrier. And I got to a point again where I'd stopped taking my medicine. So I had this slight depression where I didn't want to run anymore. My wife thought I was taking my medicine. She'd moved there at the time. Anyway. Then one day in March, um, I got a phone call that my brother had passed away in a car accident, my youngest brother. So I said, oh my God. Went to his, obviously, my, our distraught mom, set up the funeral, set up everything, picked out the songs he liked, you know, the whole thing. This was 2010. And I went back to work after 10 days and they said, 
We're going to have to cut your pay. I said, you've already cut me once. I can't, I can't do that. Okay, bye. Ten days after I buried my brother. It was heartless. So I'm on my way home in my car. I don't want to call my wife. And my mom calls. I said, what's going on? She said, Grandma's not going to make it through the night. I said, holy shit. It's the trifecta, right? I'm thinking, what else could go wrong? So, and I wasn't drinking at the time because I was told not to with my medicine. So on the way home, I got a six pack and snuck it into the house and started drinking it. And I started to feel a little better. That's what it does. It's masking stuff. So then we got through that trouble period, moved to Sacramento because I heard a job was opening here and we had to wait for it to open. So I, it was kind of like a Band-Aid approach. So I went out there for a year. I hated it. There's no weather out there in Sacramento, <laughs> just so you know. Unfortunately, now there's a big fire, but there's, no, there's nothing. I was very unhappy. So I stopped taking my medicine because I noticed my lithium that I was on at the time was making me fat. In my eyes, I was getting fat. So I stopped taking my lithium. And of course, the whole adventure started again. Small ups and downs uh, at first. Got the job here at um, Channel 5, KSTP. I got the job. And then eventually, I started taking something else. I went to my current psychiatrist, and he gave me Tegretol, which for me so far has been a miracle drug with a cocktail of other stuff. But he said, this won't put your weight on you. It's not not shown to in most people. And I said, that's the one for me. But I still wasn't getting thin. So as you know, there's always or usually some other existing condition with being, having bipolar disorder. So I started measuring all my food. I started saying, I'm not going to eat more than that much rice, that much green beans or whatever it was. Even green beans, I would eat three of them. So pretty soon I got thin and I said, holy crap, I look great, but I still could lose a little here. I don't like the way this looks. And my doctor noticed that I was getting thin. So he asked me what I was doing, what was going on, and I told him, and next thing I know, I'm at Melrose Institute. I was an outpatient. I didn't have to stay there. So it was the troubling part was when they took my, uh, my heart measurement. And I saw weird beats, and she, my doctor pointed it out. She said, this isn't good. You've got to get out of this. this. You have to do this. So I saw therapists and doctors and dietitians. I did the whole thing at Melrose, and they're wonderful. And I, a year later, I was well. And I'm, I'm still sometimes I think of that, but I haven't gone there again. So that was my kind of my side disorder, if you want to call it that, that a lot of people, the comorbid, I think they call it. And I also had anxiety, which I think most people who have bipolar do, and OCD. It's like, holy crap, I'm like a poster child. So like, what, what don't I have? So I was mad again. And then I somehow I started to accept it. I started to see my kids in a different light, and I thought maybe they have to know. I hadn't told them yet. My wife had told them that I was in the hospital because I collapsed, which was true. But one of them was 18, one was 16, and one was I don't know, 8. So we didn't need to tell the kids everything, but we wanted to tell them that I had collapsed. So I started to get better and better about it, and I started to feel better. I called my mom. I told her. So I, I wanted to do something while I was out here. I wanted to somehow kind of kind of propagate the really good feeling that I have to other people who have mental illness. But I didn't want to tell anybody because I'm on TV and we're perfect, you know? <laughs> we have perfect makeup, perfect clothes, perfect hair, used to. We, we used to, you know, you have to, <laughs> thank you. We used to, ha we're supposed to have perfect, you know, we're perfect. The public doesn't need to know that we're imperfect. God forbid they should find out I have a, a dink in my armor. Ching. So, I mean, what would they do? So my wife and I, when she knew that I was okay, really okay, she still went into Walgreens and Sam's Club and picked up my prescription because I was still horrified. Somebody would see me going out all the time. What's wrong with him? 
Most people don't really care. But in my mind, that's what I was thinking. So I called NAMI. Not for the reason you think. I said, my name is Ken Barlow, and I'm a, a meteorologist at Channel 5. I really would like to help you. Just tell me what to do. Because that was my way of coping with it even more, was to help other people without telling anybody about me. So time came two years ago when I went to the NAMI walk. I called my mom and I said, would you mind if I tell the audience that dad had bipolar disorder and that we as a family didn't know because of the shame and the stigma, which is true. So I'm standing there on the podium and I'm looking out at the crowd and everybody has banners and signs. And if you've been to the NAMI walk, you know what I mean? They're saying, end the stigma, stop hiding, it's okay. And, and I'm looking around, and I, I told my dad's story, and then I said, but it doesn't end there. And then I blurted out that I had bipolar disorder as well. And everybody clapped. I said, if I knew they were going to do that, I would have said this seven years ago. <laughs> so <clears throat> from that point on, I went to the car, and I said, guess what I did, honey? Don't forget, she's the wall builder with me. She helped me build up the fortress where nobody could see this. I said, I just told 4,000 people that I had bipolar disorder. <laughs> she said, you what? <laughs> and a few other choice words. So you're gonna, you know, she was worried also because I made her worry that I was going to lose my job. So I went to my boss on, that was a Saturday. Then on Monday, I went to my boss and I said, this is what happened. Is that OK? <laughs> And she said, you have to be who you are. And I said, what? I, because I expected employers, all of them, not some, and I know there are still some or many that don't like that fact, that somebody might have a mental illness. But my boss, Lindsay Radford, she's the news director, she said, you've got to be who you are. You can't, you can't hide. If you want to make that public, go ahead. So Amy Gustafson from the Pioneer Press, somebody from the NAMI walk had called the Pioneer Press, and, and called and asked if she could do a story on me. So I said, sure. I thought it'd be this little corner story on page eight. So <laughs> the newspaper comes out, and we don't have the Pioneer Press delivered in the Northwest. I live in Maple Grove. We get the strip. So I went to the gas station to get it, and I looked, and it's a banner headline. Ken Barlow, not alone. And there's my picture. And I said, oh my god. <laughs> so, so my wife actually said, after she read it, that was a really good article. People will, people will understand that you are OK if you're on TV. And you look perfect, but you're not. My wife said that, which to me was huge. Because I could still feel a little bit of resistance from the time that I blew our cover. <laughs> so from that point on, uh, Twin Cities Public Television Almanac, um, Kathy Werzer called me and asked if I would do a show on TV. And I said, saying in the newspaper is one thing, but going on television and telling a live audience, that's different. So you can see me kind of emerging here out of my protective shell. So I got on the air with her and Eric Eskeler, her husband, the hosts, and I explained kind of what I was thinking at the time. It went over really well. My wife liked it. Between the newspaper and the Almanac show, I had literally hundreds of emails. None of them negative. You know they're out there. But none of them made themselves visible to me. Everybody was positive. Oh my god, thank you so much. My, my mother has that. My brother has that, and he's so ashamed. I'm going to show him this interview. I'm going to show him the newspaper. Maybe it'll help him realize that somebody on TV who looks like king shit, like he has everything, really does have everything, but he also has this. And as long as he takes care of this, everything is fine. I take care of it. I have my ups and downs, like everybody else. But I take care of it, and I said that on the air. So then I get home the next day. I go to check my, my Gmail, and somebody wrote a private letter to me, and I started reading it. It said, I'm here in my, my Central Park Terrace, and I'm looking out over the greens. And I'm like, who the hell is this? <laughs> so I kind of scrolled down, and at the bottom it said, Glenn Close. 
the actress who also started Bring Change to Mind because her sister has bipolar. And I said, holy crap, Trace, look. So I didn't know how she got my Gmail. She got it from Almanac. They knew that I wouldn't mind. <laughs> so I still have that letter. And in it, she started out by saying, it's a wonderful thing. The more we talk, the more people understand. And then she said, from the bottom of my heart, thank you. Glenn Close thanking me? That's pretty heady. Not that she's this huge actress, but she started this organization, which I had started to read a little bit about. And there was a commercial, um, the John Mayer song. I can't remember the name of it, but they were in Cent Grand Central Station. And they all had t-shirts on. And they all had their disorder written across their chest. And in the end of the commercial, everybody's t-shirts faded into regular ones. It was a really, say what you want to say, I think was a John Mayer song in it. And when I saw it, I, I thought it was great. And then here she is thanking me a couple of days later after I saw the commercial. So I wrote her back and I said, you know, if you ever need me to do anything, fat chance she's going to answer back. She did. So she said, we'd love to get you involved somehow, maybe speaking, maybe doing spots for us for television or to show fundra at fundraisers and stuff. So I did. I did a fundraising video clip for them. I never met her. But I did a fundraising clip with a bunch of other people, patients, and it went to this big Hollywood party. So all these actors saw me. That was kind of <laughs> cool. So I, I got involved that way, too. And I said, wow, this, this must be OK if Glenn Close wrote me a letter, because she started this thing. And she's, she's famous. I was starstruck, admittedly. But she also was in this to help her sister. Her sister, well, I don't think she, I wouldn't use the words proud, but her sister came out like I had and told the public, you know, basically just because your sister is a famous actress doesn't mean she has everything. She has a sister who has bipolar. So everybody, it's what I say when I go out, I say everybody knows somebody with a mental illness. They may not know it, but if one in four people have it, something, depression, bipolar, schizophrenia, whatever it is. Somebody's got to have it. If there are six or eight people, at least on the raw statistics, my son, who's a professor at Iowa, would kick my butt about the stats. He does that stuff. So, because I'm not using the right verbiage. But anyway, so there's got to be some people that you know and love who may be ashamed, who may not want to tell you, who may not want to go to the doctor. They don't want to be one of them. So what I do now is I go out like, I do, like I'm doing now. And I talk to anybody who listened. Dr. Shull said I talked to Mayo. It was a room like this, and I talked to them. But I also talked to a group of five people who had meetings. I don't care. If people listen, I'll go. I just got back from a conference in Duluth where I did that on Friday. Saturday, I was at a hero's walk in Maple Grove for um, soldiers with PTSD. I'm here. Saturday, I'll be at the NAMI walk. My doctor gets worried, don't worry. <laughs> Tells me to pull back a little bit at times. But um, So that's what I'm doing. I'm, I'm going around the state talking to anybody who listens. So the, the, the irony here is here I was with my wife. We built this fortress around us. I didn't even tell one of my brothers. I was, I was being my dad. Kevin can't know. He'll think I'm a wuss. He can't know. My God, what would he think? Well, when I told him, I, I said, I've got something to tell you, and it's really, it's really affecting my health. He said, what? I said, I have bipolar. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so it was my self-created problem. So, <laughs> so what I'm doing, again, is I'm, I'm going to places, and I'm telling people, and I get questions from people. And the patients always ask me, how did they take it at work? And I think that's one of the biggest obstacles that we have today, is to get employers to understand that it's OK. It's OK that we all know. So I'm going out and talking to businesses. Again, anybody who listened. Usually the CEO isn't in there. But hopefully somewhere down the line, the HR person will mention it to somebody who makes the rules or who has 
thoughts about this kind of behavior where just because you have a mental illness, you can't be a good employee. So I'm going to high schools. I went to Lakeville North, and I only go to schools that already have a system in place that can handle whatever comes out of the talk. So when I was at Lakeville North, then I get choked up. The, the, <clears throat> I actually haven't said this before. The students were there, and it was an optional come to the auditorium if you want to see this. It was full. People were sitting on the floor. And I said, this is what we want. These are kids. These are 16, 17, 18 year old kids. If we can start them this way, they'll be better than us, than we were. Maybe not the way we are now, but growing up, it's like, it's a lot like, um, I, have a, I have a friend who's gay, I have a lot of friends who are gay, but I have a friend who's gay, and he, he told me, boy, you know what, when you came out like that, it was like when I came out to my family. I felt that relief like you did. I felt a ton of weight off me. So anyway, the, the kids in the audience were standing there, and I was talking, and I said, you know, you don't have to wear it on your chest. You don't have to wear a name tag saying, I'm Ken, I have bipolar, or I'm Susie and I'm depressed. You don't have to do that. But if you tell one or two of your good friends that you trust if you don't want anyone else to know, do that if you're comfortable with it. And a girl stood up in the audience and she said, my name is Katie and I have depression. And she got a standing ovation. And I said, I can't follow that up. How do you follow that? Well, I finished the speech and I got back to work. And Lisa Holine, who's a, she works for Dakota County, she's also a counselor at the school. After I had left, two students came in. One of the other kids wasn't, the third student wasn't at the talk. But the two kids that were came into her office and said, we're worried about, I don't remember the, the boy's name, and she probably didn't tell me, we're worried about him. We should, they didn't say intervention, whatever kids say, we should tell him that it's not safe. Will you do it? So she did. She went to him and talked to him, and sure enough, he was having suicide th suicidal thoughts. He wasn't planning or anything, but still, an 18-year-old kid with suicidal thoughts, you know that happens so much, and they carry through. So she got him, got him into treatment, and he's doing great. So if I do that once, like I did, that makes me doing this and bearing my soul absolutely nothing. This is nothing. Because I've gone from that fortress of not even telling my brother to now talking to thousands of people I don't know. And again, I haven't had one bad email. They're out there, but no one has sent me one. And I answered every one of them myself because I was so excited. I was so happy that it had this kind of response. So I've, been, I've met a couple of people, high profile people, who are also, uh, who also have a mental illness, but they're petrified somebody would find out. So three of them, um, I don't even want to say what they do, but we, we've had coffee. We have coffee on a regular basis because I'm okay with what I've done. They're not, so I can be their outlet, and they trust me, even though I'm a weatherman. <laughs> I just made that one up. I'm going to write that one down. So I've had these coffees with these, with these people, and, and I'm getting requests all the time from moms and dads, but it gets to a point where you can't, can't do everything. You, you, plus, I'm so afraid to get involved in kids. Like I said, the Lakeville North thing was different because they have a whole, um, um, what is it? I like to say it's I like to say it's the drugs, but it's being 52. It's what? It's counseling and intervention. Yeah, intervention and all that stuff. They have a, a a place where kids can go after I talk. I won't talk to a high school that doesn't, because I don't want to set anybody off who may be borderline or whatever. So. After that, after she told me that, I did another talk at Hosanna Church down in Lakeville, and they were expecting 200 people and 500 people showed up. It was open to the public. And it was the same thing. It's not because it's Ken Barlow. It's because, 
It's because it's, it's anybody who's high profile and is talking. Because they, ha I found out, most of them either have relatives or very good friends who have a mental illness. And they want to come to you and tell you about it. Uh, I get goosebumps every time I think about it. I didn't know it at the time, but they were giving out postcards when people left called A Note to Ken. So a month later or so, Lisa called me, the one who organized. She organized this, too, because it's down in Dakota County, Lakeville. She gave me a scrapbook this thick. And I cried because it's the thank you thing again because I understand. Not thank you for being Ken. It's thank you for showing that people can do this. People can have a normal life. You can, you can control it. And I say, yeah, it's like high blood pressure. It's like cancer. You have to go to chemo if your doctor says it or you're not going to get well. Well, I have to take my meds or I'm not going to be well. And the biggest thing I tell people who ask me for advice, I never tell them about the Tegretol. That's only between us. Um, is that, I mean, professionals, well, you're a professional, is that you can't drink. You can't do drugs, like illicit drugs, because if you do drink, I have friends who I've met having coffee who have bipolar disorder, and they had a glass of wine, and I, and I don't want to preach, but I said, are you sure that's a good idea? He said, yeah, why not? I said, because you're taking drugs to be stable, and then you're drinking something that makes you unstable or destabilized. So that's, the, that's my most important thing. Obviously, take your medicine, but I tell other people, you have to not drink. If you drink, it leads to bad things. I know. I drank that six-pack that night like it was nothing. Having not, I hadn't drank anything for like three or four years because I was on my medicine. But on my way home after I lost my job, I got that six-pack, and I drank the whole thing when I got home. Yeah, it made me feel great for a little while, but the next day I woke up and it was the same. So that's what I tell people. Do we have time? Are we going to do questions for 10 minutes? Thank you. Thank you, guys. Um, I, I do want to say this, too, that uh, I, I know it's some people consider it a curse to have something like this. But I wouldn't go as far to say it's a blessing. But I would say that I, I believe in fate. And I think because I saw a tree blow down when I was seven years old and I got interested in weather, and I knew I was going to be a weatherman on TV, I used to take an empty milk carton and an empty toilet paper roll and make a camera. <laughs> He's analyzing me now. <laughs> I set it on my dresser, and I did the weather. So I always knew I was going to be on TV. I never knew I'd have a mental illness. But I think given the, given the platform that I have, having both is kind of what I was supposed to do. I mean, whether you're religious or not, it doesn't matter. It's, it's, the, it's the fate thing. I really believe that I was meant to do this. There's there's a there's a counseling department, but they, this this Lisa is a mental health counselor. They actually have mental health counselors, not not guidance counselors. Well, they have those too, but this is an actual person who is trained uh, in the mental health field. I can give you her name if you want afterwards. Not that we know yet, but they know now. When I mean, they had to know before. <laughs> Unfortunately, it was after the NAMI 4,000 people, the exact thing that's going on. They knew that I was taking pills, 
and that I had some chemical imbalance going on, and it was called bipolar disorder. But I never, wa I never wanted to burden them with the, with the huge ups, and especially the downs when you have suicidal thoughts. and that You don't need to tell your kids that. It's kind of a... But we, we told them what to look out for in themselves. My, my youngest is 16, my daughter's 24, my son's 26. So they've been through this with me for seven years. And my daughter, who's 16, the other ones when they were home, my 16-year-old will tell me, are you feeling OK? Are you fe do you feel a little up today, Dad? Because I still do. I mean, I'm not a, I'm a fast cycler, rapid cycler, so I go in fact, I was telling Dr. Sauls I was a little hypomanic this weekend, and the olanzapine, is that what it is? Knocked me on my ass, and it's the best thing that ever happened, because I, I feel like Ken again, which is great. The hard part is listening to yourself, that, that listening to your own. You know it's, there's an evil Ken and a good Ken, my doctor calls it. And whenever the evil Ken starts to think, how wonderful it was to be super skinny and how wonderful it was to uh, run 20 miles without being tired. The smarter Ken, the good Ken, comes in and says, it's not that good. You'll die. And I have kids. So whenever I think like that, whenever I feel like I've had enough, I can't take these medicines anymore. I, can't, I think about my kids. My wife, the funniest part about her, one of the funniest parts about her, besides her sense of humor, she has to have it with me, is that she knows when I'm up because of my footsteps across the kitchen floor. She knows when I'm feeling a little up because of the footsteps. So they know what to look for. We know what to look for in them. Um, so they are, they are very educated. In fact, we went to our first thing together two weeks ago, Stomp Out Suicide Walk in Wyoming. We all went there because my son happened to be home and they wanted to go. So I thought that was really cool. You know, Ken, I was thinking as you were talking, it, um, it's such an honor for our department here to have you come visit and to diminish the stigma about this illness and the related psychiatric uh, illnesses. I'd like you to know that we have people here in the department who are very interested in how to reduce the period of time from the onset of bipolar disorder so it's not for a long time. We have Danny Gerke who works on the adolescent inpatient service. Uh, she does a lot of work with young people who uh, have the onset of uh, serious illness. Dr. Dave Bond just joined us. And he had worked for 11 years at the uh, University of British Columbia oh. in their um, early identification and treatment of bipolar disorder. And uh, they would love at any point if there's something that you would like to do with our faculty when you might give a talk somewhere to be sure that we can make the point. What are some of the things that might come up? Uh -huh. What is a symptom that could mean you ought to come in and get evaluated? I do. Um, I speak. I can't remember the professor's name, but he has uh, residents a medical residence where he has a one-day uh, mental health. Unfortunately, that's all a lot of them get is a one-day thing. So, so I go in along with somebody who's depressed, who has depression, and we talk about manifestations like all my misdiagnoses. That's our little, that's our little part, but thank you for the invitation. The other thing I want to say, looking back at my adolescence, once I, once I got educated in what, this, what the hell this thing was, I could definitely see things when I was younger. 12, 13, 14 years old, where I just thought it was Kenny, I, Ken. <laughs> I just thought it was me that I was, you know, so hyper and I was so this and so that. And then there were times when I'd get so down. I mean, I distinctly remember because those things stand out in your head. And then when I was 16, it became even bigger, but I never gave mental illness a second thought. My poor dad, I was diagnosed when I was 45, he was 60. So he lived another 15 years of this undulating pattern. Anybody else? Anybody else have any other questions, comments, thoughts about this? Yes. Absolutely wonderful way for us to He had a question over there.
I do. I still, I, the one that I had, I actually, because of a few different issues, I had a therapist anyway before I went to Boston. Um, so I had somebody already when I came back here. He retired recently, so I, got, so I have a, another person who is fantastic. And I go, depending on what's going on, I may go once a week, I may go twice a week. So I think, I think therapy plays a huge role with, it's not just the medicine, although medicine is really great. <laughs> I won't talk that long. I'm just the MC. So. <laughs>